I'm going to start Facebook Live. And I'll let everyone in now. Email on Sunday, and indeed, <laughs> A tanto io, no?
Hi, Catherine, can you hear me? You may need to unmute. Yes, I'm, I can hear you. I think we're still letting people in, so Kelly's, there won't be any sound until everyone's in. Okay, Kelly, can you hear me? Yes, I would start now. Should we start? Yes. Okay, you'll still presumably be admitting some people. Yes, I'll carry on admitting everyone. Okay, so um, hello and a warm welcome to everybody. And thank you for joining us at this um, really exciting Autism Care Pathway webinar. Um, we've had an absolutely tremendous response uh, beyond our expectations. We were hoping for 200 people, but we've had nearly a thousand registrations, which is, um, is really encouraging. Um, we'd like to thank all of you who have supported us in sharing the flyer and um, sharing with your colleagues and um, supporting what we're trying to achieve through this webinar. So firstly, could I ask you if you could keep your video switched off, please? And simply because we have so many people joining us, and this is to ensure the best sound quality. Um, and if also you could please mute yourself as well as turn your video off, because that will affect the sound quality of the presentations. So it will only be the presenters that will leave their video on and there's and they will unmute themselves as they present. Um, this is the agenda for this afternoon. And we'd like to invite you to watch the packed video um, at a comfort break at 1.40. And also we'll have a question and answer at 2.40, where the panel of speakers will be available to answer your questions. Um, as there are so many people that have joined this webinar, we, we do uh, appreciate we may not be able to answer all the questions today, but we will take um, those questions and answer them on our PAC website. So please do look at the webinar page on the PAC website where there will be all the resources from the webinar. There will be a recording, there will be transcriptions, PowerPoints. Um, and, and question and answers there for everybody to access. Um, please do post your questions on the chat function. I see everybody is already starting to chat. We will be collecting your questions as we go along um, and we will be presenting as many as we can to the speakers at the question and answer session. So um, we've got a very uh, a nice combination of presentations. Um, first of all, it's, it's a real privilege to have Professor Jonathan Green, um, who's presenting on you know, it, 20 years worth of successive research. Uh, the trials are independent, but also connected. And it's the accumulation of that evidence which has brought us to this point where uh, that we're able to provide um, information on the best support services for children with autism and their families. So um, it's, it's a, I'm really delighted that Jonathan can present the scientific evidence to us today. Also then, this is followed by Helen Harbin, who's a, a senior specialist lead speech and language therapist at Warwick NHS. And she'll be talking more about the pra pragmatic practical implementation so in their NHS trust, they've been embedding um, evidence-based practice into their services. She'll talk about how they've done it and encourage other trusts to follow that good, um, good model of service delivery. I'm delighted uh, we can hear from Louisa Harrison, who's going to present a parent perspective. And 
it's important we consider parent values, what their aspirations are for their children. And then we've got Amanda Haydock, who um, it's a great compliment to have her join us as an autism advocate. She represents um, the positive attributes of the autism community <clears throat> and their contribution to <clears throat> our, our community and their values and aspirations. I'd also like to thank uh, Tanya Farley and Kelly Warner Keith. Um, they have made a tremendous effort in bringing this together in all the organisation, responding to all the emails and registrations and disseminating flyers. So, you know, a really heart warmth um, thank you to you for all your efforts. So now I'm going to hand you over to uh, Tanya, who will be introducing the speakers. Um, so please continue to post your questions. Thank you, Catherine. Good afternoon, I'm Tanya Farley. We are delighted that Professor Jonathan Green, co-founder of the PACT programme, has joined us today. Jonathan is going to present new empirical evidence for a paradigm shift in the approach to autism intervention. Uh, uh, and oh, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, paradigm shift in the approach to autism intervention from reactive to proactive, a developmentally informed, more rational approach to intervention. Welcome, Jonathan. Hello, everyone. Um, just to check that you can um, hear me and see see my slides. Can I have a thumbs up from Catherine? Great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk to everyone today. And uh, uh, I want to um, start off by um, uh, really thanking and paying a tribute to Catherine, who has been such a driving force behind the uh, PACT intervention. But this um, uh, collaborative uh, program today. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you about the new autism early detection care pathway that we have um, put together uh, and uh, to present to you the evidence on which uh, we think that this can be um, now promoted for, um, for colleagues. So uh, what are the principles behind this evidence-led developmental approach. Uh, our theme really is to provide proven and uh, evidenced support from day one of uh, uh, an autistic child's life. And um, really the principles behind this is to bear in mind that autism is both developmental and enduring as a condition. And the support uh, programs we need to have in place need to reflect this. And that's really not how currently most services around the world are organized. They are tend to be uh, somewhat patchy, reactive, short term, um, uh, according to the health system in which they're located. And the purpose of this approach I'm going to present to you is a more integrated, uh, developmentally informed care pathway. And I hope I can uh, convince you of the logic behind this and how it could work in practice. Key is that we now have evidence interventions and detection uh, instruments to help support a proactive pathway of this kind. So the idea of this is that we, um, we, we are proactive um, in, in our support for the developmental condition uh, in the hope that we can head off later problems rather than have to react to them. But we also have pulled into this um, service models from other um, areas of healthcare that have worked out how to look after enduring health conditions of different kinds. And there are some principles that um, one can um, uh, pull out from those research service models. Uh, one is that um, whatever care we put in place has to be owned by the service users, by the families, by the autistic children by the autistic adults in this case. It has to be owned, it has to be developed in partnership with them. 
and it has to be so that uh, what so-called self-management approach is is a crucial aspect that I will talk more about. We also need to have enduring support for families because we are talking about young children and their families here, mainly in this pathway, at this in this presentation. Uh, we need sustained support, what we call key working, and I'll talk more about that. And then we need a model of step care where you get the appropriate level of care that you need when you need it and for as long as you need it, but no longer. So that this can be an efficient pathway that doesn't waste resource and uses the resource that we have efficiently. And to also um, help with that, there is the role potentially in the future of digital health technology. Uh, and I'll allude to this, but I think that's going to be a bit of a game changer as well for us. So here's the model. Um, and uh, in, in sort of summary terms, and um, uh, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. The model is published recently last month um, in the journal Lancet Child and Adolescent Health. Um, the, and at the end of the presentation, I'll give you the, um, uh, the link to the, the reference for that publication. Uh, just to um, heads up that if any of you want to read this, and it is, I'm afraid, stuck behind a paywall, there's nothing I can do about that, but that if people contact myself or the organizers, we'll see what we can do to get you a copy of the, of the paper. But essentially what we are promoting here is um, a stepwise approach in development, starting pre-diagnosis. And this is one of the first innovations that this is proactive to early identified neurodivergence in development for children so that we get in place early support before the diagnostic process. And then we need support for families around the diagnostic process to orientate them, to help them adapt to the new situation um, and to signpost them to ongoing care. And that's a crucial gap that needs filling. I'm going to be talking about that. Um, and then Jonathan, after, I'm, yeah. I'm very, very sorry to interrupt, but are you on two screens? Because I think we're, say, we're seeing you need to swap the screens because I think we're seeing small slides and the presenter view with black all around it and lots of slides. Better, fantastic, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I thought I got it right, but anyway, that is that that's better for you? That's perfect, thank you. Okay, no problem. So, um, yeah, so to where I was, was with the family support around diagnosis and then post-diagnosis, um, what we need is a developmentally informed intervention that's family focused, which will help um, family adaptation and, and empowerment, uh, as well as building the uh, child's um, developmental skills. And I'm going to talk about that. That's where PAC comes in. And then finally, after that, there is a long term process of long term support, uh, because as, as we know, um, we have to have enduring support through early development into um, adulthood, uh, no doubt, in the end. Um, and so we need a system of case management, ongoing family support, and step up care when needed. So this is an integrated sequential pathway, as you can see uh, in development. The way I'm going to present it is um, assuming um, reasonably early uh, diagnosis and identification preschool. But um, uh, we recognize, of course, that many autistic children are identified later than that in current services. And this kind of model can be adapted to later uh, identification as well. So let me take you through the steps of this uh, uh, intervention care pathway. So we start with the pre-diagnosis uh, uh, processes and in a way this is the most novel and innovative and at some level controversial aspect of this pathway uh, which I'll talk with you about. Its aim fundamentally is to give early appropriate care where it's needed and to tackle this awful diagnostic bottleneck that families experience 
um, in health systems around the world. I don't think there's any health system that's really cracked this. Um, the diagnostic bottleneck is certainly a problem in the UK. Um, and the first innovative thing we have is now surveillance instruments that are evidence to pick up early childhood neurodiversity or concern, um, which um, are pretty good at identifying uh, young babies and toddlers who um, are at higher likelihood of developing autistic development. And uh, these can be incorporated within health visitor and community health regular uh, uh, developmental uh, surveillance infrastructures. Um, and obviously they're different around the world, but we think uh, this can be uh, adapted uh, internationally. And the particular measure, there are a number of measures that uh, can do this, but the particular one that we think has the best evidence at the moment is the Social Attention and Communication Surveillance, or SACS. Uh, and this is a, a, a fairly simple but really robust and well-evidenced um, surveillance instrument that can be applied from the age of one year in infancy through and through the preschool years. I'm not going to say any more about it, but this is the instrument that we think has good evidence of predictive value. Um, and uh, we are, um, you know, training all the, the originators are training on this instrument for those who are interested can get in touch. After we've identified early neurodiversity, and remember this is pre-diagnosis, but with this surveillance technology, we can be reasonably um, uh, sure that these are children at least of higher likelihood of developing autism. We need appropriate care. And the idea is to triage into a personalized evidence support for early child development. And uh, uh, this is where the, um, the model that uh, we've, we've tested uh, over the last uh, decade or more called the iBASIS VIP comes in. And I want to tell you a bit about that. All the interventions that I'm going to talk about in this presentation are what we call parent mediated interventions. So I'm just going to say a word about this general model of intervention that applies to the PAC treatment as well. Um, this is a method of intervention that works, the therapist works just with the parent. Uh, they don't work directly with the child, but they work with the parent in the context of their, the parent's uh, dyadic interaction and family naturalistic interaction with their child. And the idea behind this is that we can work with the parent in that way, in a targeted way. Targeted alterations in parental behavior appropriate to neurodiversity then lead to improved child dyadic communication. That's the theory. Whether this actually happens in practice is a matter of the evidence, which I'll present to you. And then the, the next bit of the chain, as it were, is that if the child has this altered dyadic experience, uh, improved dyadic communication, they will generalize that into um, more general uh, social functioning out uh, in the community with other people in other contexts. And this generalization step is the uh, crucial uh, step to developmental improvement. So this is the general model that we are uh, aiming for. This represents a, uh, a real paradigm shift in the way we approach autism intervention. It is done, as I say, with parents in the context of normative social development. It's based on a transactional account of known developmental processes. And in that way, it, it, it feeds into ordinary child social development across the neurotypical as well as the autistic spectrum. Working in this way definitely does not imply there's anything wrong with the parenting. This needs to be emphasized. The parents work with us as co-partners. They want to do the best they can to be the best parents they can be. We work with them to help them do that. And as you'll see in the evidence, parents are wonderful at doing this. There's nothing wrong with parents. All parents need is the guidance to liberate their natural skills and the information to do so. This leads to, as a spin-off, uh, potentially uh, parents feeling empowered, skilled up, 
and much more confident to manage their child and family life, which is a huge benefit. It also, as a spin-off, is quite efficient on uh, professional time um, in the sense that the once we've got this in place, the parent does a lot of the work, to be honest, uh, as a, in the course of their normal parenting. Uh, and uh, therapist time is, is relatively minimized. And this 24 seven therapeutic effect, we think is key for the intervention having long-term effects after the treatment end, as you'll see in the, in the evidence. But this isn't straightforward. This is not simple psychoeducation. It's not coaching. It's not tea and sympathy. It's not generic support, although it's all those things in a way. It's a really specific therapeutic technique where we uh, produce really a, a focused uh, change in parental understanding and responsiveness. And we do that using video feedback. And so I want to emphasize this is quite a technical procedure and uh, it's rather specific in the way that it works. And we found that video feedback is very helpful for that. So I'm just gonna show you the generic process that we that we uh, do in these kinds of therapy. Um, we take a videotape of the parent uh, with the child in a naturalistic setting, and then we play back this videotape itself with the therapist and the parent together. So I'll just show you how this works. Nathan, stop. Okay, Beepo. Beepo. Where's he going? You found me. You're so clever. Clap hands. So Not here is the yes. Here is the therapist with that parent showing this video clip back and exploring it together. Um, the one where he understands Nathan. Uh, yeah, that's, and he got quite excited when I stopped it. Yes, the first time he yeah, stopped this. Yeah, um, um, I think that's right at the very beginning. And that's something that's really quite interactive yeah. because yeah. he, re I think he realised I did that and it made the game more fun. Yeah. Um, well, let's watch that bit again. So you'll see that um, this is a, a collaborative model. They, they uh, basically the parent and the therapist explore the video together. It's not the therapist telling the parent what to see, although they clearly have knowledge and uh, uh, a manualized progression in the back of their minds. But really the process for the parent is a mutual exploration. And it's important that the parent uh, uh, explores and, and discovers things about their child. And that what, that's what makes it exciting for the for the parent and really lodges in their mind. So the first uh, method that we, uh, first context in, we, in which we use this method is the uh, so-called uh, iBasis VIP, the infancy intervention. Uh, this is pre-diagnosis. It's a home-based manualized intervention, 12 sessions over five months uh, with daily practice plans for parents. And it follows a, 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 sequ a sequence of early developmental themes um, uh, where the parent gets sensitized to the, uh, the child's uh, particular pattern of communication, any uh, alterations or, or, or complexities related to the child's neurodiversity uh, are taken into account and the parent's sensitized and alerted to them. Uh, and through this process, the parent really gets to know their baby, infers the intentionality of their intervention, of their communication. Uh, even though their communication may be a bit atypical for the parent's experience, um, they are able to understand this difference and understand the intentionalities, generalize to everyday activities, uh, link with feelings, uh, and, and then develop um, interactive uh, communication and talk. And we have a lot of... Um, uh, uh, adaptations we make to early atypicality within this kind of manualized approach. Fundamentally, we're after 
shifting the uh, dyadic style, uh, which is consequent on early on early neurodiversity. And just to give you a little brief example of, of this, what we are hoping for, here is a baseline. This child is really young, about eight, eight months or so, um, in our one of our treatment cohorts. See how mum's working hard to engage baby and uh, he's sort of reactive but a bit passive and uh, and then we um, this is what we hope for at end point. <laughs> You'll see how much more active the child is face to face with mom and mom's waiting and watching, mirroring him and uh, responding and then entering into uh, a social anticipation game with mutual enjoyment. Uh, you'll all be familiar with this kind of thing. This is the context within which social learning, language learning, communication starts to take place. And this is what we are uh, um, uh, promoting with the therapeutic work. So that's the theory. That's what we do in, our, in the therapy. How does it work in practice? So for this iBASIS intervention, uh, we did our first trial in the UK several years ago with babies at, at higher likelihood of autism from nine months of age. And when I present the results of these trials, it'll be in, in three sections. Firstly, the way in which uh, we've been able to shift parental dyadic response. This is parental behaviors. Next is the way we've been able to then consequentially shift child dyadic communication. And the third is this level of generalization to overall, all, overall autism symptoms with a different person in a different context. So there are three stages to uh, our evaluation of how well the interventions work. And here in the iBASIS trial, the period of therapy is seen here uh, on the left of the graph up until this vertical dotted line. This is the therapy. And at the end of therapy, we see we've really shifted. This is the, the heavy line here. The continuous line is the treated group. The treatment as usual comparison group who didn't get the eye basis treatment is along this horizontal line here. The difference between those two lines is the difference the intervention has made within this randomized trial. So what you'll see is that we've made a big difference to parental dyadic response, what we call non-directiveness, which is the targeted change we're hoping for. And that that sustains, that change sustains over the next few years, because we follow up the kids at about three and a half. Uh, but maybe falls off a bit here. We have a change in measurement. Then the next uh, level of this is the child's communication with the parent. And remember, we don't actually work directly with the child at all. So this, this change in child communication is the, the consequence of the parental change. And here you'll see we get a lag effect so that the child does change in their um, dyadic communication, the amount of dyadic communication, uh, but it, it, it takes off just at a, at a slightly slower rate than the parent change, which is what you'd expect, but it's sustained right the way through. And the difference between these two curves, this area in here, is statistically what we measure as the treatment effect, and it's highly significant for those of you interested in the statistics. So we've, we, we get this sustained change in child dyadic communication with parent. And then the third 
uh, thing, which is our primary outcome, if you like, is whether that change is generalized out into other contexts with other people. That's the key generalization. And you'll see here, this is measured on the ADOS and the AOC, for those of you who are into more research side. And here the line goes down because we're reducing severity of autism symptoms or autism related behaviors. Uh, we're improving social functioning and reducing severity of the, uh, uh, the other behaviors. And we've succeeded in reducing the severity here at the end of treatment. Um, and although it just doesn't quite, uh, the overlap here suggests that it doesn't quite reach significance in its own right, but the fact is that it's sustained through the next couple of years. And it's that sustaining that gives us this significant effect um, over time, intervention effect over time. So we do get a generalization effect as the result of this five month treatment. So this uh, infancy intervention was more recently replicated in Australia uh, with uh, colleagues in Perth and Melbourne. Uh, and they did a, um, a, the same intervention, exactly the same, but with community identified children. So these are children who've been identified with community concerns on this sax instrument that I mentioned earlier in the talk. Again, the same five month intervention and three year follow up. And in, sense what, in essence, what we found is exactly the same result as we got with the UK trial. Here is the outcome effect on autism symptoms and social functioning. And you'll see this sustained reduced um, uh, level of, of, of autism related behavior. So we've, we've really reduced the, the um, significant trajectory here over time following up from the intervention. And what happened additionally in this trial was that uh, they did a clinical best estimate, that's what this stands for, autism diagnosis from independent clinicians at three. And they, uh, these clinicians had access to all the data, uh, including the ADOS, the parent-child interaction and other measures. And they did this formal diagnosis against DSM criteria. And uh, the key thing that they found these clinicians was that for the, um, the parent-child dyads who had received the intervention, they were 60% um, uh, less likely for the child to have developed autism. The Thank child you. still had um, some neuroatypicality in development. They were still neurodiverse, but they had gone below the autism threshold. Uh, so that's a 60% reduction. These numbers are relatively small, uh, but this um, uh, uh, study was unequivocal in its result that this kind of early intervention seems to be able to reduce uh, the amount of um, autism uh, diagnosis above threshold. This is the first, uh, what we call preemptive, uh, uh, pre-diagnostic intervention, which, which has shown a phenotypic reduction in autism. It needs replication, but it is a powerful result and it's consistent with um, other findings that we have on the improvement in the ADOS, et cetera. Uh, you're, many of you will be familiar that this uh, paper that was published uh, last year uh, was, uh, um, had a lot of publicity and some controversy. I don't have time today to go into all that. I'm happy to do that in question and answer. But in essence, there were some concerns that we were, as it were, getting rid of autism. Um, but I think the key point that we were able to make was that it's not really that. It's that what we're doing is providing really good, focused, early support, the kind that all children benefit from. And as a result of that, um, the children were showing less uh, distress associated with neurodiversity. It's, um, as I say, I can't go into all the, um, the, the dialogue that we had with people around this, but uh, we think this is a, a significant result. It's not about trying to get rid of autism, it's about giving appropriate early care, which then has beneficial developmental consequences. So that's the first part of the, of the pathway. It gives us evidence now 
for essentially starting a proactive care pathway at the earliest signs of neurodivergence uh, before diagnosis. I'll come back to that point. Then when we get to the diagnostic process, uh, around diagnosis, uh, when the diagnosis has been made, we do need good family support. And uh, this is because families need uh, or an orientation to this change in their lives. They need support and they need signposting uh, in terms of uh, future care to get. Uh, this is a crucial point, uh, at which there really isn't any good evidenced um, care packages at this sort of around diagnosis point for families. Um, although a lot's done, it's largely unevidenced. Uh, we are ourselves doing a group program for, for um, uh, young families with an, uh, a diag an autism diagnosis just made. Uh, and that trial is in process to see if this uh, combination of psychoeducation and a emotional support therapy uh, will we'll really give help for the families at this stage. And we'll have the results of that in a year or two. Then we come on to the post-diagnostics uh, primary intervention. And this is where we, we want an intervention that's family focused, strengths-based uh, strengths to give sustained support for parenting, for parental empowerment and skills, but also sustained support for the child's developmental progress, uh, particularly around their social and communication development. And that's the, 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 the purpose, we think, of the intervention at this particular part of the pathway. Fortunately, the, the uh, best evidenced interventions at the moment do precisely target that. And uh, this has been recognized by the UK NICE Committee and various other international bodies in, who've reviewed the evidence. Uh, and one of these social communications that is particularly family focused uh, that has been shown to have these effects uh, is indeed the, the PACT intervention that we've worked on uh, with Catherine here in Manchester and uh, collaboratively across the UK. So a few words about PACT. Uh, which uh, we now call the pediatric autism communication therapy because it can be applied um, into the early school years. It's a slightly longer program than the one I've just described to you, six to 12 months, focused on the developmental dyad, uh, as you know, I've said before, targeting parental awareness and responsiveness to uh, neurodivergent development and, so and social communication. Uh, just as a, uh, as it were, a difference from other autism interventions, uh, we do not use a behavioral modification or behavior learning principles in this intervention. This is really, really very different to those kinds of behaviorally orientated autism interventions, ABA and other interventions of that kind. As I hope I've explained to you, this works much more with um, the early uh, developmental transactions that underlie or actually all um, child social development. It's staged according to early communication precursors and it, as I said, it uses video feedback. So it works in these three levels, as I've um, mentioned, the work with the parent, uh, inducing change in the child's dyad, and then generalization. And we've tested uh, PACT in this big series of trials over the last uh, almost 20 years now, um, uh, the, the PACT trials. Uh, this is one of the largest, at the time we did it, it was the largest uh, randomized trial in, in autism. It certainly remains one of the largest to have been done, uh, 100, over 150 children. And what we did was to uh, do this random allocation You'll note that these are um, children at, at the beginning who um, have core, what we called at that time core autism. In other words, these are quite uh, significantly affected kids. About 80% have learning disability. Only 25% at the beginning had phrase speech uh, at the preschool level. So these are quite significantly affected. Um, they had a 13 month, 12 month intervention with the PACT. 
uh, which you'll hear about the, the nature of PACT later, more clinically. And then we followed them at 13 months after the end of the intervention, and then six years after that, when by this time the children were in middle childhood at a mean age of around 10 and a half. And uh, at this age, we achieved 80% follow-up, which is pretty good after such a long time. And um, when we assessed these children at that age, they were still, the, the assessors, the people who were doing the assessment were still blinded to which treatment, which group these two kids were in. So we retained the blindedness at, even at that follow-up stage. We've published these, I'm sure you'll probably be familiar with many of you with these, the papers that we've published on this and others since. Um, and the findings too, which are essentially uh, very similar to the iBASIS findings. So here is the effect of therapy on the targeted parental behavior. And this is uh, midpoint, this is the end point of the trial. And you'll see that we've, this is the blue line is the treatment as usual. So the, these families in this arm of the trial were getting a whole range of different therapies. We didn't constrain that at all. Uh, and in this red line, the families were getting other therapies if they wished them, but, but the packed therapy in addition. And here you'll see the addition of the PAC therapy has resulted in uh, a very significant uh, treatment effect to improve uh, the parent's ability to be aware of the child's communication and respond to it. That's essentially what we are measuring here. And this is a big treatment effect. And it over time, whether because of the way we measure it or it just washes out, that treatment effect has diminished by the time we follow them up in middle childhood. But this area between the curves, this area in here, is what we measure as the developmental impact of the therapy over time. And that is highly significant for these parental synchronous responses. And then we come, as we did before, to the child targeted child behavior with the parent. So this is the dyadic communication. And you'll see here's midpoint, this is endpoint, this is follow up. And the thing to notice here is that we have induced, it's not such a big change uh, as with the parent, but it's a significant change, particularly in the so far as it's sustained right the way through until 10 and a half. So remember, this is the end of therapy, but this change sustains itself six years after the end of therapy until we followed them up virtually undiminished, which is an extraordinary result. And then when we come on to the autism symptoms, which we measured using the ADOS, the standard uh, um, autism phenotype behavior measure, uh, what you'll see here is again, a diminution of the extent, severity of autism symptoms uh, at the end of therapy. This is a significant effect at the end of therapy, and that effect is sustained right the way through until follow-up. Uh, and as you can see, it's not diminished. The actual treatment effect, it, it sustains itself right the way through, and this area under between the curves is highly significant. Um, that effect we also looked at in terms of parental uh, reports of their child's language, social um, communication functioning, repetitive behaviors, adaptive function, and also some of the teacher ratings. And these, um, all these ratings support the blinded findings here uh, of uh, improved child functioning. Uh, so this is a, uh, a powerful result, particularly in the how well this is sustained over time. Uh, it's actually a unique result, there's no other therapeutic trial that, which has been done rigorously to have shown a treatment effect sustained over this time in autism. So this is an important uh, uh, evidence behind how we can uh, advocate a therapeutic pathway of the kind that I'll return to in just a minute. You'll also have noticed that the effects we get in each of these trials, these, this is the um, the iBASIS, this is the, the baby trial, this is the Australian replication, and this is the PAC trial. 
the, the kind of effects we get on autism symptoms, phenotype here, are very similar in their shape, which is a very interesting result developmentally. This is done preschool, this is done in early childhood and infancy, and you get the same kind of effect at each stage using this kind of therapeutic approach. We were also interested to know that was what happened. Then we wanted to know how it happened. How was this treatment effect actually uh, uh, delivered for the, for, the, for the child? And we've done these mechanism studies, which again are some of the largest uh, uh, in the field and published these. And in essence, what we show is that it is this change in parental synchrony that is the, is the thing that is responsible for the change in child dyadic communication. And we hypothesize this, but it was really important to have shown it. So changing parental synchrony as we define it is the thing that really makes the difference here. And that supports the logic behind the uh, PACT and the iBASIS therapies. Equally importantly, this change in child dyadic communication that is the thing that, is, that mediates the autism symptom severity outcome. It's not the parent change that mediates this. Sorry, it's not the parent change that mediates this. It's this child uh, dyadic change that mediates the autism functioning. And what this suggests is the child is really internalizing the, the different uh, dyadic experience and able to apply that in other contexts and thus generalizing their social communication functioning in a way that neurotypical children do. And what we've shown through this is that uh, neurodiverse children can do it as well, given this kind of therapy. We've also shown the same mediation approach uh, actually mediates the long-term uh, effects to middle childhood. So the child communication initiations are the thing that make the difference to six year uh, symptom outcomes uh, six years after the treatment end. Uh, and this is um, an important result in itself that suggests how important these communication initiations are uh, in, in long-term developmental change. Uh, uh, and they get embedded somehow in the child's development, which is very encouraging. Then more, more recently, we've adapted uh, a PAC to um, uh, a kind of combined home and education package. And uh, uh, this we thought would be a good idea to be able to disseminate the work further, but there were complications with this. The, in order to do home and education together, and when we did it in education, we did it with teaching assistants in the UK uh, who worked with their children in the, in the classroom. And there were lots of issues around doing this. It's a good idea, but the, the, the amount of dosage that we could put in, in terms of how many sessions with the parents and the educators uh, was much lower than with clinic-based PAC that we had tested before. The education context, while it's great to do this kind of thing, it is complicated to really initiate and sustain an intervention of this kind. And we did a lot of online therapy during this in a time when we weren't so familiar with online therapy. Bottom line is that doing it like this has a bit of a reduced effect. It has the same kind of effect on parent synchrony and child initiation, but it this, these, these effects don't then mediate this generalized change uh, in child symptoms in the same way. Uh, and this, is, we've, this was good learning for us. Um, it suggests that uh, there is a dose effect here. You do have to have a certain level of dosage and the right environmental conditions to produce the um, developmental change that we've reported elsewhere. Important to note that we did, however, improve parental well being and child challenging behavior, both at home and school. And those are important uh, concerns for many families indeed. So um, this is our PAC parent mediated intervention. Uh, we've shown that we can do this kind of work across 
socioeconomic status, education, culture, ethnicity. We've done it in uh, South Asia and other places. And um, uh, also with parents on, who are themselves on the autistic spectrum. So this looks very uh, um, widely applicable across uh, uh, all these kind of um, areas. No ever adverse effects that we've uh, really recorded apart from parents sometimes find the pressure of time understandably is hard. And uh, we've done a lot of studies of patient experience and you'll hear, hear a bit more about that in uh, later talks from Louisa particularly today. And uh, we're doing PAC training. We've done PAC training in 21 countries now. Um, and uh, Catherine will talk more about the the training procedures in PACT a bit later this afternoon. So my take home principles before I return to the pathway are that uh, autistic children of all kinds can respond um, to this kind of improved understanding and response from their parents and other adults by increased social motivation, engagement and communication. Uh, parents uh, can develop these skills and feel better for it. And children generalize these experiences into improved social functioning elsewhere in their development. And that this is the best evidence route currently for improving long-term child's social functioning and symptoms. Uh, and we need a critical amount of specific intervention to shift this developmental process. So those are the take home messages from this work. Uh, and this is why we advocate this kind of intervention as this foundational treatment uh, for post-diagnostic support. Then just to complete, uh, uh, just to finish off and complete the latter stages of the pathway. So after we've put in place this foundational family-focused intervention that I've just described, which is aiming to empower families, but set children's development off on the right foot um, for their later development into school years, et cetera, uh, we know that's not the end of the story. Uh, as children go into um, uh, school experience out of their families, uh, often difficulties arise. Uh, autistic children are vulnerable to uh, a lot of difficulties and co-occurring conditions. And we need to be able to support families and children through that time. The first way that we need to be able to support them, and I'm not gonna talk about this very much at all, but just to note, that environmental modification, autism aware environments in school, in social settings, and later on in work environments are gonna be crucial to help good adaptation along the model I've described. But we're also going to need to be able to provide specific treatments for co-occurring conditions, anxiety, depression, ADHD, obsessive compulsive conditions, behavioral challenges, all of these things are quite common in autistic children currently. We have some evidenced interventions for uh, these range of conditions, but we need more research on the specificity of them. This is where we come to step up care because these treatments then need to be um, delivered by autism specialist services of one kind or another. Uh, and we need to signal for families when they need that care, give them the care, and then the step down bit is to, when that care is finished, step down into the foundational case management subsequently. So this is what we call step up, step down, but it's against a background of the foundational care and support that we've put in place earlier in the pathway. Digital technologies can definitely help. Uh, uh, we think for the future, although these haven't really been implemented that much yet, I'm not going to talk about them very much, but we've got some digital apps to help surveillance. Um, we have uh, co-owned health records, digital health records, which we can uh, co-partner with families early uh, in the process after identification and embed into digital health systems. Uh, and this is going to be a challenge for health systems to put this together, but we think this is going to be crucial. Uh, and then uh, smartphone apps can give community support to families for each other and with professionals. 
and what we call digital navigators who are going to be able to be online caseworkers for families, efficiently being able to link with them, signpost support and respond efficiently to difficulties as they arise. So all this use of digital health technology is there ready to be done. It just needs health system change to implement it. And uh, let's hope that can happen over the next few years. So this is the model in summary, uh, starting at the earliest stages of identification of neurodiversity with pre-diagnosis care, family support around diagnosis, primary intervention, and then ongoing case management and step up, step down. You'll see it's a sequential model. It'll take the families through their child's development. Uh, and we hope that it'll be additive. If you get each of these components, you should end up with better outcomes. And as we implement this pathway, we hope we'll be able to show that. We're doing implementation currently in the UK, in Manchester and Cambridge. And this is the uh, reference to the uh, paper that we produced earlier this year, which has the pathway model in detail. In Australia, they are um, planning a national implementation of this pathway or something like it. And in low and medium income countries, particularly South Asia, uh, we have colleagues and collaborations which are going to uh, introduce this kind of process into South Asia. And that's very exciting. Uh, adapted for low income settings uh, and to different health systems. And if you're interested in reading more about how we're doing that, this annual research review in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry uh, has got a detailed uh, uh, description of how we, how we do that. So that's, uh, that's the pathway. That's my talk. Uh, thanks to my colleagues uh, who've um, been wonderful in um, collaborating with me and the team in producing these uh, trial results. Here's the PAC collaborating team. And um, here is a, um, a thank you slide, which has got more information about uh, on the, the various interventions I've mentioned, training in PACT, training in the iBASIS VIP that we're hoping, well, we're planning to start in, the, in this summer. Uh, and I, the, here's the, my emails on, the, uh, on the, uh, the slide there if you want to get in touch with me. So um, with that, thank you very much for your attention and uh, look forward to Q&A when it comes a bit later in the talk. Thank you, Jonathan, for that uh, groundbreaking uh, presentation. Um, we now warmly welcome Helen Harbin. Helen is a speech and language therapist and clinical lead in Warwickshire NHS. We're excited to hear what she has to say about Warwickshire's experience of embedding PACT in their practical innovative autism service and their plans for future growth. Helen. Thank you, Tanya. I think Kelly's gonna help me out with the slides, but I'll make a start. So thank you, Kelly. So I'm just going to really summarise how PACT was introduced and developed in Warwickshire. So we, I'm in South Warwickshire NHS Foundation Trust, a very forward looking trust, I would say. We started with a very small scale pilot project with no additional funding, I will say. I'm going to talk about the impact of PACT within Warwickshire and how we embedded it into our current um, NHS provision. Obviously, it's a very exciting time currently because NHS England have named PACT as a recognised intervention for autism. So as it just feels like a really good, appropriate time to have this webinar this afternoon to really encourage people to take that step, particularly within the NHS to, to make PACT a reality. OK, next slide. So how PACT started in Warwickshire was I had half a day a week, um, which wasn't a lot, um, and I focused on introducing it into the south of the county. Um, I became aware of PACT because of the autism literature. So I, I really felt it ticked so many boxes for me um, about in so many ways. So I went um, to speak to my manager and she agreed that, that I could be trained as the, as the first therapist within Warwickshire in 2018. So we decided after the, the training, which again, it just really grabbed me. And I just thought we have to do this in Warwickshire. We have to make this happen. It's just, we've waited too long for an evidence-based intervention for autism. 
So we started very small scale with just two children and then added another two children. So altogether, we, we had four nonverbal preschool children as our first packed um, intervention targeted group. Um, we decided um, to really focus on that very small number of children because of the time that, that I had available. We also decided to focus on preschool children, those just about to go into school, and particularly those where families and, if we're honest, therapists felt really stuck in terms of progress. Interventions had been tried, but it really felt that progress just wasn't being made. So we targeted those, that particular group of children, taking referrals from within speech and language therapy team, obviously very much focusing on families who could commit, uh, because it is a commitment at the end of the day, um, so to the, the daily practice of half an hour, but also these fortnightly sessions, which we offered over a six month period. We decided to offer it pre and post diagnosis so that the, the actual diagnosis itself didn't become a barrier or a complete focus. Um, and we decided that we would obviously go for the face-to-face -face intervention because it was uh, 2018 when I did my training and things really got moving in 2019. So we went ahead with face-to-face -face intervention and started PACT. And we obviously agreed that we would review that after the pilot. So moving into 2020 and the next slide, how did it all go? I have to say positive feedback across the board from all four families who were all very different it really felt like high quality intervention and absolute, as, as Jonathan described, this true partnership working. It's not about involving parents. Parents are absolutely at the center of this intervention and combining their detailed knowledge of their own children. They understand the context. They know what the children have been doing the day before, what they've been experiencing with the skills of the therapist. It really did uh, just I was so surprised um, that actually, you know, within Warwickshire, we could also make it work. It wasn't just about all of the hard work that had been carried out in the research. It did actually work in practice, which was fantastic and a real felt like a real privilege to, to be part of. As been described, there have been remarkable changes, not only in the children's development, but also parental confidence and that feeling of empowerment. And I was really struck particularly by one, one parent who described initially that um, playing and interacting with their child felt like a war and she felt she lost every battle. And that really felt so powerful. But at the end of the 12 sessions, her comments were that the child loves interacting with me now and he's a very different child. So I think getting that feedback back was, was very, very um, strong for me. And it really made us feel um, we need to move this forward. So inevitably, there was a high demand for the therapy, which is understandable. During this time, we gathered qualitative feedback from the families and asking them to document their views at the end of the sessions. And also obviously speaking to um, the wider groups who were involved with PACT. So speaking to other professionals as well. But we really need the availability because demand understandably really, really increased. Okay, so next slide. What we tried to then do is increase our availability within this very small project, also again with no additional funding. So what we managed to achieve was we got agreement to train three more of the specialist therapists from within the autism team. We presented on every occasion possible to the wider speech and language therapy team, stressing the packed principles Whilst they, they weren't able to all access PACT training and deliver PACT in its entirety, we still felt strongly there were many principles that could be embedded within speech and language therapy practice to improve the, the offer that was available within Warwickshire. Some speech and language therapy staff shadowed the PACT sessions, so came out on, on sessions, obviously with parental consent, to really experience PACT um, in people's houses and to see how then they could take that forward when the children finished the PACT intervention and returned onto their own caseloads. Parent-child interaction therapy, PCIT, was also offered within Warwickshire, but therapists felt that, that there were, again, because of the PACT principles that were described, even a, a different model itself could be enhanced and improved by knowledge of PACT principles. 
And again, any opportunity to present to my education colleagues or other education um, or wider the groups such as uh, clinical psychologists were also taken at every opportunity. So what happened next? Let's have a look at the next slide. So we've got all these people ready to train, lockdown. So great timing, we were all ready to go. However, we've tried to have a pragmatic and positive attitude as, as, as we find with impact. We moved immediately to an online PACT offer, which was very interesting. Um, I felt initially that the face-to-face -face, um, contact with the parent was absolutely key to develop that therapeutic relationship. So I was very interested to see how that would um, translate um, to moving online. I was pleasantly surprised. It really did increase the availability, the reach, because I was no longer restricted to only being able to offer it in the south of the county because of travel um, consequences. I was able to offer it across the whole of Warwickshire, which obviously did really increase the reach and, and it was more equitable across the, the area. I was lucky in that um, South Warwickshire NHS Foundation Trust resolved IT issues very quickly. We had laptops, we had work mobiles, we used um, WhatsApp for transferring videos. So parents took the videos themselves at home and then transferred to us using WhatsApp, a, a platform they were very comfortable with and very familiar with. So hopefully reduced a bit of stress there. We used um, Microsoft Teams to, as our platform. And again, people were becoming very quickly, very familiar with that. So and interestingly, what comments I got back from parents was that the online, um, experience in some ways felt like it gave them more control they were in charge of the videos they decided for themselves which videos to submit and they also commented that they could share the video footage with other members of the family before they were submitted to help decide but also interestingly after we'd had the sessions they reported going back and sharing it with the wider family and talking through the packed discussion that had happened in Warwickshire, we refocused some therapy time to enable us to deliver PACT from early birds, so um, a parent-based training program about autism and um, that we were no longer able to do during lockdown because of restrictions. So we did have some additional time to put it into PACT, which was um, much appreciated. One thing we did alter, um, and this was very much a consequence of lockdown, rather than the 12 sessions that were initially offered, we reduced that down to six sessions and then a review. And that was very much because I'm sure looking back, we, we, we remember the consequences of lockdown and six sessions took us three months ahead. And that felt like a reasonable amount of time that parents and therapists could look ahead and predict how things were going to feel, what we could commit to. Um, but committing to six months of therapy and six months of availability from families, that felt like, um, quite a high demand. So we decided to alter the, the, the dosage down to six sessions, but with very much the option to review. So for some children, um, parents felt, and therapists also felt that at six sessions, parents were really on their way and often they had then gone into school. So that was a natural break. For other families that we worked with, six sessions felt like they were just really getting going and absolutely definitely we needed to continue for the full six, for the full further six, and, and families felt very much the same. One of the other options we added in at the six month, six session review was the option to include um, educational settings. So one of the families felt very strongly that she was clear on what she needed to do, family were clear as well, grandparents were all on board, but when they went into nursery, um, communication uh, was not obviously following a uh, pact principle. So she felt very strongly that nursery would benefit. So what we agreed was that the nursery could attend a pact awareness session, if you like, held online, obviously, with myself and the parent attending at very much as, as co-hosts of the training, which again gives a really nice balance um, from between the therapist and the parent. Nurseries took this on board and several actually offered as well to record footage of themselves in the setting with the child and then join again online for a further pack session to look at the video, look at the video evidence and use that 
um, to discuss and work on things that they could see were really effective. What, what were the things that worked during the session? Focusing on those principles and looking at all the positives that were happening and how could they do more of that? So we got, again, high quality feedback going on um, throughout lockdown. Um, and that really did give us encouragement to see where we should go next. So I think the next slide also, um, is this is an example of one of the techniques that's used, which is very much freeze framing um, um, and a slide. So looking at the video footage that was happening, but actually if you see something really interesting, stopping the video and freezing it and getting parents to look and see what they noticed and then having a discussion about what was going on and having, having a real sort of in forensic look at the interaction and, and the play that's happening there. So that's just an example of one of the things that is, is really helpful to do. It's, and obviously online, that, that's very straightforward to, to do. Okay, so next slide. Yes, one of the schools um, offered this um, experience uh, of having uh, the, uh, the packed session online. So really enabling them to, to work with parents and outside agencies, giving that consistent approach. And as adults, they really felt they become much more aware of limiting their language and making sure that it's purposeful and meaningful. And interestingly, yes, no longer being worried about silence because that can be exactly what's needed at times. And overall saying it was a very positive experience, enabling them to celebrate as well as unpick some of the interactions. So obviously any intervention is not going to be all straightforward. So there were some challenges along the way. Clearly not all families were able to commit to practicing for 30 minutes a day and submitting videos in a timely manner. And sometimes certainly during the first lockdown, it became difficult for some families and it was just not practical to continue, but they were very much in, in the minority. Most families, I think, really appreciated that high quality intervention at a time when maybe there wasn't a lot of support going on. Um, and I think parents really commented on that. Of course, there were IT frustrations at times with connectivity. So that, again, potentially was a difficulty. But again, families overcame it. We used other means if we had to. There was illness at times, but again, minimized because of the online um, approach. So even when people were self-isolating, as long as they were well, they could still continue with packed intervention. However, of course, one of the other issues was, again, demand outstripping capacity. So we needed to look at where we went with this. So in terms of next slide, 2022 and beyond, we now have four packed therapists trained within Warwickshire and within the autism uh, team. Also two additional PACT therapists trained, who we've described as um, autism PACT champions to act as a point of contact within the area. So if people have got queries around um, whether a child's appropriate to refer, to want more information about PACT, they are very much on hand to give that uh, advice and are very hopefully very approachable and accessible. In total, when we started in 2019, up to early 22, 30 families have now received PACT. And again, that is without any additional funding. So I do feel it has made a difference within Warwickshire, but clearly there's a lot more work that needs to be done. I hoped originally that there would be an impact on tribunal cases as we go forward, as many other trusts, um, we in Warwickshire have a large number of tribunal cases, where parents are really seeking funding from the local authority to implement um, other autism interventions that are significantly less robust than PACT. So I'm really hoping that as PACT becomes more widely known, we can have that as an evidence-based effective intervention that will stand up in tribunal if, if need be. Clearly we're promoting PACT wherever we can. Two of our therapists have become PACT associates, so becoming involved in um, delivering PACT training, which is very exciting. We're in the very early stages of this. Business case for funding is absolutely uh, on the horizon. And in that, obviously, we will be reverting back to offering 12 sessions um, as the core offer in line with the research. So moving on to summarise some of the, the um, benefits to professional services. Obviously, it is suitable for pre and post diagnosis, which I feel is, is, a, is a significant issue. It's not about getting a diagnosis to enable people to get access to PACT. It's there as a support going along. Obviously, enhance our, uh, our care pathway within Warwickshire. We're now able to offer this, admittedly, to a small number of families, but it's there now and it wasn't there before. 
um, because it's an evidenced intervention, there's a lot of professional confidence going into um, offering the intervention. There are outcome measures because we, the parents set their own targets and using the very gentle video feedback using this guided discovery techniques, progress is made across the board. Any therapist using PACT has had to pass fidelity training. So it's not a question of just attending the course and then off you go. Um, it, you know, there is quality control, which I think as, as a therapist, but also as a, as a family, hopefully gives it, you know, a strong re reassurance there that people have had to, to hit a certain level of, of competency, which is, which is very important. It really does give adults that empowerment um, to, to manage things going forward and using the cascade techniques. So people in research, then training other people, and then those people training further people, and then moving that on to the important adults within the child's everyday environment, whether that's parents, carers, or other people within the educational setting as it's been touched on. And just a professional quote, fact giving a very structured individual pathway to intervention. So moving on to benefits for the children, Obviously, um, being understood, understanding others, just so important. And I feel PACT more than anything is about acceptance, acceptance of difference, looking at what makes the child's interest. And it's not about change. It's all about developing those connections and that social engagement so that the children really want to engage and seek out that interaction with other people. And very much yeah, focusing on the positive attributes within a very supportive environment, because understandably, it is quite exposing for families when they send videos to, to therapists who maybe at the start, they don't know well at all. Um, and, and it is quite revealing. So I think to have the confidence to do that, that the sessions have to be extremely positive and extremely supportive. We're looking at hopefully increasing the frequency and also the range of communication by parents becoming even more skilled at spotting those opportunities and just seeing what the child is actually trying to communicate by reviewing and reviewing the videos and cl clearly then improving relationships as well and reducing some of those non-functional maybe distressed um, repetitive behaviors as was described earlier so many many benefits there so now to, to conclude onto the most important person, which is uh, the families here. And this is an example of one family's experience of PACT. We haven't got sound on that, Helen, sorry. No, I'm just hoping that uh, my technical support can... Uh... Oh, here we go. We feel incredibly lucky to have been able to take part in these sessions. Um, I would actually say it's been quite life changing for us as a family. It's completely opened up our communication with our daughter. Um, she's gone from being um, completely nonverbal, having very limited eye contact, um, really struggling with attention um, and, and frustration, really, that we couldn't understand her, to now we get excellent eye contact. Um, really meaningful um, communication in terms of she gets very specific now in terms of what she's trying to tell us. She can sit down and play with us for more than 30 minutes, whereas before we'd get lucky if we got two minutes. She actually gets something out of us playing with her now. Um, she's a lot calmer because she knows we understand what she's trying to say. Um, this is also fed into school as well. When Taylor started in September, um, the school was actually misreading her signals. Um, quite a bit and when we got involved and sort of said like explain to us what you think's happening when we introduced them to PACT and got actually got them involved in doing PACT sessions with us and Helen um, their whole technique changed and within two days the feedback was totally different Taylor had become calmer there was hardly any frustration and um, the school were calmer as well and um, so it had a massive a massive impact both at home and at school um, she's actually said some words now. Um, so I think for me, PACT really should be rolled out to a lot more people. It should be a lot more accessible. Um, I think it should be the starting point of speech therapy if you've got a non-verbal child, to be quite honest. Um, and I think it's the techniques involved would benefit a lot of children. Um, my frustration at the moment is the outside agencies that are coming in to help Taylor um, every single one so far has never heard of PACT. Um, 
So when I'm trying to get them to keep the consistency at school, I'm having to explain six months of training within a one hour meeting. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if everybody could consider that a bit more. And um, let's try and get it rolled out to a few more people in the UK. Um, and thank you very much to Helen and to Beth. Um, I will be forever grateful for being able to take part in PACT. Um, and that's it. So, Okay, so I think that that really does demonstrate the power of PACT and also emphasise the importance of that therapeutic relationship. But interestingly, I've never been in the same room as Louisa. So whether it's online or whether it is face to face, PACT hugely powerful and of huge benefit to so many families. So to conclude, now that we have an effective evidence based approach for autism that's been developed here in the UK, I just feel it's essential to make PACT a reality for all families who would benefit, particularly within the NHS. So I'm hoping that whether you're a parent, carer, a professional or a commissioner, I hope you feel maybe a bit more encouraged now to further investigate PACT and consider just what an incredible difference PACT could make to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Helen. That was a, a really inspiring talk. And I thought that parents really summed it up perfectly. Um, my, I'm going to suggest that we are actually quite short of time. Should we just take a five minute comfort break, come straight back and just get on with the Louisa's uh, presentation? And then hopefully we'll have time for questions at, at the end. If you're happy with that, Kat. Yes. We've got five minutes. I think that's a really good idea to take a quick comfort break. I can actually um, share the screen and just play this video. Probably is only going to be five minutes. So I'll just share that while people on their comfort break. We are um, taking note of all the questions and we are going to get them all answered and sent out anyway after the event if we don't get round to it. Lovely. Because I think it's not meant to do it is one of the most, um, you know, distressing features. I mean, it really is terrible. I mean, getting when you're so at sea with it all and don't know. But my, my father in law's got a very good expression. It was just, you feel like you, you can't touch the sides, and I think that is that one for the time. Undertaken into a social communication uh, treatment for autism internationally to date. So, just from the point of view of a treatment trial uh, and its size, that's a major milestone. So, the number of children that we've enrolled into this trial, um, over 150, is at least double for anything else that's been done previously. And in the treatment trial world that we work in, size is important. You know, the bigger your trial, the more accurate your results are. Like. Yeah. So this is a. Uh, one of a group of um, uh, communication interventions that uh, have been developed internationally over uh, uh, the last decade, I would say. Um, ours is similar but different to some of the other interventions. They all have as their aim to improve the communication skills of young children with autism. Uh, what uh, we are particularly doing in our intervention is we're using our knowledge of normal development in neurotypical uh, children and the way they develop communication and language 
and we're seeing if we can apply this to the situation of autism. The vision is to build a solid partnership between the research organisation, professional and the families to take the best quality therapy and make it oh, accessible. Qualcosa ne sull'autismo, io mi avevo fatto la resistenza, ma poi non me lo sono appuntata e me lo sono dimenticata. E era nel 12 e mezzo, quindi mi ricordo che non volevo dimenticare, non volevo dimenticare, non volevo dimenticare, e lo faccio anche più male. Ho aspettato che per i mani delle stelle accettasse. Ovviamente il mio sono stato mangiato, ho fatto il colletto, cioè diciamo, mi sto, adesso sto vedendo che mi avevano accettato, e è tutto in inglese, cioè è tutto in inglese. Initially, I felt like um, I was just watching and waiting, living and observing and being with her truly, uh, which was difficult for me because you just want to, you tend to, you know, step in and, and say things or do things for her. But... into the daily lives of children by working within the family home, within nurseries, school contexts, or a caregiver context, so that the intervention can pervade the daily lives of children. What do you see as being different about this? He's, he's open to me, he's initiating. Um, it's sort of his genuine interest in it rather than me forcing it on him. What do you see from his body language? That he's... Or that he's comfortable with me. Very, very comfortable, very calm, isn't he? In hindsight, having watched the video, it was a better moment than you'd initially thought. I think we need to... I think we need to wrap it up now, Kath, and continue. <laughs> Hi, welcome, uh, welcome everybody back. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce Louisa Harrison. Louisa is a parent, teacher, and a pack trainer. And Louisa is going to share her first-hand experience as a parent and professional, addressing what really makes a difference to the lives of autistic people and how we can strive to achieve this. Louisa. Hi everyone and thanks Tanya and thanks to all of you for attending this important event today. So let me start with some introductions. So I'm a mum, I have two teenage children, I'm a teacher but for the last five years I've worked with families and schools as a PAC therapist and I also deliver PAC training to professionals. And this, this is Frank, my 15 year old son, this is on his birthday last year. And PAC, well this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. From what our life was like early on, before we knew about it, to where we are now. I'll share my experiences of how PACT has helped Frank communicate, but also how PACT has worked for us in ways that stray very helpfully into other areas. Areas that are less to do with communication and more to do with ensuring good outcomes into adulthood. I'll highlight this through using video of me and Frank interacting together. 
And using a video will also show you how the packed process works, how illuminating it is, how sensitive and supportive it is, and how empowering it is for those parents, teachers, teaching assistants, caregivers, whoever it is that is with the child most and therefore knows the child best. So what was it like early on before we knew about PACT? Well, early on, it felt confusing. Frank's communication was extremely limited and very hard to figure out. Yet I was desperate to understand him, to know what he was thinking and how he was feeling. I wanted him to be able to communicate effectively and understand the world so that he could feel happy and safe. I wanted to get it right, but I wasn't sure how. Frank received a diagnosis of autism when he was three. And this put me on a different trajectory with no conventional milestones to look out for, no similar points of reference with other parents. And my instinct initially, and the instinct of many adults I now work with doing PACT, was to keep trying to engage him. But this often became an exhausting and frustrating task for both of us. And as these pictures illustrate, sometimes he engaged with me, and sometimes he was just too interested in other things. So I wanted to know how he might feel more inclined to share with me. So this short video um, illustrates how I soon sensed the answer. And this realization has informed my beliefs about what makes a difference to autistic people ever since. So this is a family holiday on the beach. Mind where you kick your feet, Dad has got his camera down there. Come on. So Frank is with us, but not with us. We're all enjoying being on this beach, but we're all enjoying it in different ways. We're chatting a bit and faffing about, and this is of no interest to Frank. He's enjoying listening to the sound of the waves. And most of all, he's loving the wind, blowing the windmills round and round and watching the sunlight catch on them. And I realized that rather than getting Frank to share this with me in a way that I might with another child, I had to find a way to join that felt right to Frank, not necessarily right to me. And this is such a fundamental insight. It had to feel right to Frank more than it felt right to me. And then I came across PACT. So PACT addresses everything that I've mentioned so far, and it gave me the approach I was looking for that felt just right. So how is that? How is it different from other interventions? Well, so lots of interventions are child-centered, but PAC takes this to a deeper level. It tunes the adult in to understanding the child's precise focus. So for example, it's not just always oh, interested in the marbles, say, but rather he's interested in the different colors of the marbles or the way they sound when they roll or the way they look when they roll or the way they feel when you put them in your hand. So when we come to this next point about adult adjustment, the adult then, is sharing the child's interest in a way that exactly matches their focus. And that level of sensitivity and synchrony is what makes the difference. For children that find it hard to communicate and therefore to trust others, we need to make it easy for them. We need to adjust ourselves to share in the right way, at the right moment, at the right pace and with the right words. And the effect of this is that interactions feel more comfortable to the child and in turn more comfortable and easy to the adult. So it enhances that feeling of being in tune, being together. PAC then is not about teaching, but about trust and building balanced, secure relationships. And the method used for being able to do this so effectively is what everybody doing PACT really values. Watching video of the adult child play shines a light on what exactly is happening 
moments that would otherwise be missed are captured, rewatched, and discussed. The therapist guides the adult to reflect, what was happening there? What did he do? How did you respond? How did you know to do that? And these discussions lead to moments of revelation and insight about what led to a positive interaction and how that can then be built on. But to do this requires a collaborative approach. It's the adult who's the expert, the adult who knows the child best. And the therapist guides the adult to moments of discovery. So it's a partnership and it's about doing with, not doing to. And finally, it's positive. The focus is on what felt good, when it felt connected. And those positive moments in play link to PAC strategies, which then become focused goals that the adult has in mind when they play with the child between sessions. So as a parent, I quickly became more confident. I felt I had easy to use strategies that worked effectively and never felt forced. And the quality of my interactions with Frank improved and the more that happened, the more he initiated and the more balanced and safer our interactions felt, the more he was then prepared to go with my ideas too. And working as a PAC therapist, guiding this process is hugely rewarding. You're empowering the adult to appreciate when they're getting it right. You're building their understanding of how they can adapt to the child and why that's important. But also you're enabling the adult to think about the child holistically. Because through the adult tuning into the child's ideas and motivations, they're not only enhancing shared attention, they're also gaining an understanding of what makes the child tick. And this lays the groundwork for a strength-based approach. So as, Fra as Frank has developed, I've tuned into his strengths and interests and I've tried to nurture them. And this is information that can be shared between family, friends, teaching staff, everyone involved with the child can notice and take opportunities here. It can be weaved into lessons at school, for example, so we expand from Frank's base of knowledge and experience and interest. And this helps him engage in learning that he might otherwise find too abstract. And it can also be shared with people unfamiliar to Frank to help him feel able to trust them. So I'm gonna share a video with you now which I hope will show you a little more about how PACT works. You'll also be able to see what our communication together looks like these days. To give you a bit of context, um, Frank didn't say very much at all for a very, very long time. And he's always found all aspects of communication very difficult and still does to this day. So this is about two and a half minutes long and it's from a year or so ago when we were walking to school. I'll just play it all the way through first without any explanation. Yeah, 59 miles, that's a long way on the motorway. I did the M6 for a very turn. I figured the same in Bristol. We did M6 for 39 miles. Oh yeah, we went past we went past Brereton Playground, didn't we, on the way home. Past Brereton Pickers for 39 miles and 39 miles is a plus, a plus. Oh, 20 of the sum or something now. Oh, yeah, 20 more. See yeah, more. 20 more miles. Yeah. See now. Is it? I'll go away for a bit, Dean. That's a very long way on the motorway. And sometimes we can only go 50 miles an hour. Uh, which one? Oh, yeah. Uh, which one? I don't know what bird that is. Uh, which one? I don't, I don't know what it is. I know, I don't know which bird that is. It's got a high note, hasn't it? Which one? Uh, which one? I don't know which bird. I only know, I only know wood pigeons and green finches. 
I don't know any more bird songs. Me. I am warm. Well, it is warm. It's warm at Whoa, you'll definitely be warm for running home. Oh, we made it. <laughs> I know. We made it before the tractor. Oh, there it goes. So, firstly, I'm guessing there were parts of that, maybe all of it, where you weren't at all sure what Frank was talking about. But the important thing is, is that I'm sure, I know. And that's why PACT therapists work with the adult and not the child. So there's a cascade effect in PACT. In the same way the adult is responsive to the child rather than directing them, the therapist is responsive to adult knowledge rather than directing them or telling them. So in PACT, we think about what's happening in the video. So how would I describe the interaction in this video? Well, Frank's hopping from topic to topic at his pace. He's not constructing sentences very well. It's often taking him a long time to get his words out. Should I worry about that? No, because Frank is generating his own spontaneous language with no prompting and no demands. He's relaxed, he's not under any pressure, and he's communicating with confidence on his terms in his way. And this is what PACT can achieve. And if someone had shown me this video when he was three years old, I would never have believed it could happen. So how am I involved? How do I keep it going or help to keep it going? Well, Frank chooses the topics and I go with each one. And within, within each topic, I'm using packed strategies to keep the conversation going. So I'll just show you an example. Just watch this clip here. <laughs> I did all the M6 for a very turn. I figured the same in Bri oh, Bristol, who old M6 for a 39 miles. So, what am I doing here? I'm giving Frank time to say what he needs to say so he doesn't feel rushed. I'm waiting, I'm reducing my expectations, and I'm letting him lead. And these are all strategies within PACT that adults learn. And just before this moment, here, you can just see it now. Look, he's glancing to me. Well, what does that glance signal? He's sharing with me that he's finished. So by me matching his pace and letting him lead on his topic, he's initiated a social cue, a glance. I know he's ready for me to acknowledge him. So this requires sensitive observation from the adult. And this is how we maintain synchrony by really tuning in to all signals, however fleeting. And these are further packed strategies that we learn. I'll just play on from here. Oh yeah, we went past we went past Brereton Playground, didn't we, on the way home? So here I acknowledge what he said by naturally repeating back but adding a new word. I say, oh yes, we went past Brereton Playground on the way home. And Frank then repeats back, past Brereton Playground. So here I'm expanding vocabulary, expanding his vocabulary and building on his topic. And this kind of interaction leads him to want to say more. Watch here. 39 miles and 39 miles is a plus, a plus, a 20 of the sum or something now. Oh yeah, 20 more. Yeah, more. 20 more miles. So Frank is now talking about different distances on this journey that come up on the sat nav. Again, a therapist wouldn't know this, but I do. So I can then describe and explain what's happening and the therapist can guide me to understand how to respond best to help Frank stay engaged and to help him be more reciprocal. So I said, oh yes, 20 more, 20 more miles. And here I've learned how to model to Frank what he means to say, but in a natural conversational style. So he never feels corrected. Now I just want to show you something else. Watch what happens here. Uh, which one? Oh yeah. Uh, which one? So Frank is asking a question. 
And I should add, it took years for Frank to be able to ask a question, but now he's able to confidently seek information that he's interested in. But second, he's changed the topic just like that, but I move on with him and this helps maintain the interaction. But see what else happens here. Just watch here. I don't know what bird that is. Uh, which one? I don't, I don't know what it is. I know, I don't know which bird that is. It's got a high note, hasn't it? See? Which one? Uh, which one? I don't know which bird. I only know, I only know wood pigeons and green finches. I don't know any more bird songs. So Frank gets a bit anxious and frustrated. Why? Because he can't cope with me not knowing which bird it is. I'm not sure he understands that I don't know everything. And we have this problem quite often. But the PACT style of communication supports this issue because through his lived experience, I can teach him naturally that I don't know. So I try and put it into language that he'll understand. I only know wood pigeons and green finches. And after this walk to school, at other moments, I'll try to generalize by taking opportunities to point up other things I don't know. So this is an example of how PAC supports social understanding, areas outside of communication. And one final example of this, I mentioned outcomes at the start. Frank changes topic because he hears birdsong. So he's sharing with me that he's interested in birds. So aside from me trying to maintain the conversation for as long as possible, why is it important to go with this? Well, we all have interests, don't we? And some of our interests become hobbies and some hobbies lead to developing friendships with like-minded others. And some hobbies can lead to realizing a talent which might lead to a job. When the stakes are so high for autistic people, when the things they find difficult can hamper their chances for a smooth transition into adulthood, shouldn't we be engaging in active noticing and then taking seriously all opportunities to nurture strengths and interests and find outlets for them. So Frank now names all the birds we hear when we're out and about. It's amazing how he can tune in and distinguish which bird is which. And it's also a reminder that when we talk about sensory difficulties, we must also talk about sensory strengths. And across this short video, Frank's interests are clear. Birds, journeys and distances and running. And these are all things that we try to nurture and things that we can see could become key elements in his life as he gets older through hobbies and even paid work. So to conclude, in my view, it's just different. Frank is just different. And my life as a mum is just different from what I was expecting all those years ago. Sometimes it feels harder, sometimes it feels easier, but ultimately it's just different. And I hope I've shown how as a parent and a professional, I see how PACT supports this difference, how it puts families on the right track, feeling more confident. Also how PACT can support not only communication, but can build social understanding within the child's lived experience and looking ahead can pave the way for how we think about meaningful outcomes. Thank you, Louise. I, I, I think that was very powerful and illuminating. And um, I think you've raised the principles for all parenting, really. Um, so uh, finally, I want to introduce Amanda Haydock. Um, Amanda is um, a professional and an autistic advocate representing the priorities and values of the autistic community. She aims to celebrate individual attributes and promote a more supportive environment to help autistic people realise their unique potential. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Um, so this um, talk is about where we've come from and where we're going in autism intervention and around the neurodiversity movement as a whole from an autistic person's perspective. So who am I? Um, you might notice that I use the term autistic rather than have autism, with autism or on the autism spectrum, as I, along with 96% of autistic people, prefer this terminology. Being autistic is part of my identity. I'm not separable from it, and nor would I want to be. Neither is being autistic my whole identity. 
I acknowledge that I'm also white, a female, a climber, and a therapist, amongst many other things. I've spent about 42% of my life so far knowing I'm autistic, and that's been a journey of acceptance, much like the one I'm going to talk about today. I was diagnosed as autistic in 2009, when theory of mind was the dominant theory of autism, and we all referred to ourselves as having Asperger's. I've been a bit like a snake really, shedding skin when it becomes too small or constricting for me. On this gradual journey towards both acceptance and celebration of myself and my autistic identity. I really wouldn't be where I am today were it not for autism. And I hope I've already had a positive impact on others' journeys towards acceptance and celebration of themselves or their autistic child. As I just alluded to, I'm a PACT therapist and originally trained in other relationship-based approaches, such as the DIR floor time model. I also have a master's in autism from the University of Birmingham. Um, I used to run an early intervention service from my home for several years, and have more recently set up Spectrum Connection CIC, where we provide PACT to families all over the country, and I've received grant funding to provide PAC to lower income families in Greater Manchester. I also have an interest in using AAC with autistic children and we're branching out into this too as we develop our service. So what are the priorities of the autistic community? To answer this question, Autistica conducted a survey asking autistic people what their priorities for autism research are. The number one priority for autistic people was in regards to mental health interventions and the second highest priority was in regards to developing the communication and language skills of autistic people. Autistic people have the same innate needs as every other human being in order to be able to self-actualize, according to the directors of the self-determination theory. These intrinsic motivations drive and sustain us. And these needs have been defined as the need for autonomy, the need for competence, and the need for relatedness. Intrinsic motivation is incredibly important in becoming self-motivated people who are confident in their abilities. Although PACT is primarily a communication intervention, I would also argue that it supports the mental health of autistic children as being able to autonomously communicate and meet their needs could be a protective factor against distressed behaviors and mental health issues. When we think about these things as long-term goals for our children, then we stop thinking about the behavior that's right in front of us and start thinking about the bigger picture. Where have we come from in terms of aut autism intervention? Most interventions for autistic children have focused primarily on shaping behavior to mold autistic children into being more like neurotypical people. This need to mask or behave in more neurotypical ways can actively harm autistic people. It is a factor in mental health difficulties in autistic adults and it starts right from childhood. Shaping and changing autistic people's behavior does not meet our needs for autonomy. Most interventions for autistic children have focused on extrinsic motivation in one form or another. For example, when using PECS, we teach a child to hand over a card to receive the reward of the item. Research over many years in many different contexts has shown that extrinsic motivation cannot sustain and maintain positive change in anyone, including autistic people. Nobody learns at their best when someone's trying to change them rather than meeting them where they are. Most importantly, interventions were so focused on doing to autistic people rather than joining with autistic people to learn about their priorities. A lot of assumptions were made about what autistic people needed to exist in the world, priorities which were highly misguided. The autistic researcher Damien Milton has developed the idea of the double empathy problem, that neurotypical people have historically had the opinion or belief that autistic people lack empathy 
However, they also lack understanding of how autistic people communicate and so show a lack of empathy towards the needs and goals of autistic people. Interventions that are based on the belief that neurotypicality is inherently somehow better than neurodiversity will perpetuate this double empathy problem. So where are we now in our autism intervention journey? We have come a long way in our understanding of autism. PACT focuses on intrinsic motivation. It acknowledges that every human being wants to connect with others. PACT is a great example of an intervention that is done with autistic children rather than to, and is solely focused on their interests, their motivations and the ways that they communicate. Rather than harnessing these things in order to change them, we are fully accepting them, celebrating them and joining them. The research shows that the most important factor in communication development further down the line is that children can initiate. This vital skill leads to autonomous communication and the ability to self-advocate. Um, as you've heard from the research, PAC demonstrated a reduction in repetitive behaviours. However, these are never targeted during intervention and in fact in some ways are encouraged, such as when repeating games the child loves and really engages in. It's therefore more likely that autistic children demonstrate a reduction in distress-related behaviours. If we think about what neurotypical people do when they feel stressed or when they have a breakdown in communication, they chew their nails, they tap their feet, they pace up and down. These repetitive behaviours uh, are a sign of distress. Support people to be their best selves and these distress-related behaviours reduce. We should always look at the reasons be behind children's behaviour and be responsive to all kinds of communication. This is why I would argue that PACT also meets the highest priority for autistic people in supporting their mental health. We cannot overstate the mental health and well-being benefits to autistic children that come from feeling heard, understood, connected and accepted, and in being able to engage in things with other people that bring them joy or comfort, or to feel understood as to what they're specifically communicating. When we work with families, we aren't really trying to teach them about autism but we are really trying to show them how their autistic child is ready and willing to connect if we meet them where they are. If we accept autistic children exactly as they are, join them in their passions, understand their meaning and everything has meaning, we will show them the true depth of relationship that their child is capable of. We support people to get into their child's world on their level. And when we do this, we see an almost magical connection between people that enables both parties to see one another's perspective. It's really hard enough just filtering all the sensory and emotional stimuli around us without people actually believing that we also lack empathy. Presuming competence and seeing the world from an autistic person's perspective closes the double empathy gap. Where are we going in autism intervention? Well, PACT works because through it we're supporting autistic children's autonomy, the ability to act on their own free will, unconstrained by neurotypical expectations. We're building confidence in increasing their ability to self-advocate. We're supporting autistic children's relatedness, the ability to connect with others and have rich and meaningful relationships where they feel fully seen and heard. And we're supporting autistic children's competence, the ability to communicate with confidence and put themselves out into the world exactly as they are. And preemptive support is vital, and we need to focus on empowerment and self advocacy in autism intervention. So, as I just said, preemptive support is vitally important to support autistic children to feel heard at the earliest possible point in their lives. This is what early intervention should be all about, providing sensitive, child-focused and developmentally informed support at the earliest possible time to support families to accept their child's neurodiversity. This preemptive support should never be about trying to change a child, but instead should focus on making the world an easier place for our autistic children. 
When the world is less overwhelming, more predictable, less demanding and tailored to individual needs, then children can grow and develop at the pace that's right for them. Just imagine the confidence and skills of potentially an entire generation of autistic children, should this be the case. Imagine the mental health benefits to neurodivergent children and their families, should this be the case. Imagine the downstream effects on school policies, the neurodiversity movement and the beliefs and expectations for autistic people, should this be the case. The autistic community is made up of millions of people, so many of whom have been harmed by practices that sought change at all costs and towards a misguided ideal of neurotypicality. Yes, there are difficulties that come along with being autistic, but so many of them are due to misunderstandings, expectations and demands. From the earliest possible point in autistic children's lives, we need to pay attention to the environment, relationships, developmental trajectories, intrinsic motivation, and targets informed by sensitive discussion with autistic people. This paper, which is co-authored by autistic people, highlights the need for intervention to meet autistic children's deepest needs, including those for autonomy, relatedness, and competence. We need to change the narrative around autism, have a whole paradigm shift and cultural change in our thinking about it at all levels, and understand that it's just a different way of being human. And from there, we can support autistic children to be the best version of themselves they can possibly be. We can support them to feel heard, to initiate, and to understand themselves so that they can be strong self-advocates. What can you do to take steps towards becoming a better ally to autistic people and support the neurodiversity movement right across children's lifespans? You can use identity first language. This is preferred by the vast majority of autistic adults. So use the term autistic unless a specific person tells you they prefer otherwise. Use correct terminology that's preferred by the autistic community, such as non-speaking rather than non-verbal, complex communication needs rather than low functioning, distressed behaviors rather than challenging behavior, abiding loves rather than special interests, we need to take the judgment out of the way we talk about autistic people and focus on how we can make life easier for them. Focus on connection above all else, above all your goals, above independence, above absolutely everything. Connection is the place that everything else grows from. When seeking advice, <laughs> listen to autistic adults above everyone else. We are your child grown up. And we might have insights that nobody else has. It's especially important to listen to non-speaking autistic people who have a vastly different range of experience than I do. Seek people out online, listen to their experiences and their knowledge to support you to better know your autistic child. And then listen to parents and carers before you listen to professionals. They often have to fight to get their voices heard and yet they know their child better than anyone else. When making goals, focus on things that are important to autistic people. Don't make arbitrary goals that focus on masking or coping or even independence, unless that's what the person themselves wants. Support their regulation through relationships that are safe and accepting. And think about how you can make the world an easier place to be in. Focus on emotional regulation and self-advocacy. Support children to initiate communication rather than respond. This is the way we grow confident, assertive communicators. Presume competence. Just because you can't see evidence of knowledge, understanding or competence, it doesn't mean children aren't capable of these things. All we can directly see are motor movements in a lot of our non-speaking autistic children, but we need to make the least dangerous assumptions about them. In the same vein, we need to provide access to a range of communication strategies as early as possible. There are millions of non-speaking autistic children that don't have access to robust communication, such as AAC devices, perhaps because we don't routinely assume competence. Be willing to be wrong. Listen to autistic people. 
Listen to families and change your mind based on what they're telling you. Believe in people over systems and seek change and openness at all levels. Accept autistic people exactly who, for exactly who they are right now. Have fun with them on their terms. Learn how they communicate. Let them know regularly and often how much they mean to you and how much joy they bring into your life. Don't try and change them, for they're exactly who they're meant to be. And it's our job as adults to change the world for them. Now that we know better, we need to do better. The evidence is clear that if we support children at the earliest possible point, they will develop the skills necessary to be autonomous and assertive communicators that can self-advocate. The focus should be on well-being, on listening to children and their parents or carers, and acceptance, celebration, and accommodation of neurodiversity in all its forms. It is a fundamental human right that all people have freedom of opinion and expression, so to be autonomous communicators. We need trust at every level, from trusting parents, trusting professionals, and most of all, trusting our autistic children. We need to give space for learning, for stepping back and observing, for this time is precious. Early childhood should not be filled with cramming and fear and too much therapy in an attempt to make our children be less autistic. Early childhood should be a place of learning, of authenticity, of wonder, of just the right amount, of just the right kind of relationship-based intervention that enables understanding, growth, ease, acceptance, trust, and sharing joy with our autistic children. It is possible for our autistic children to be autonomous, connected and competent. We just need to accept, celebrate and meet them exactly where they are. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. That was absolutely fabulous. Um, so I'm conscious that we've come to the end of the um, uh, uh, prepared presentations and I think we're going to try and take question and answers now. Um, so there are lots of questions and answers. Um, one of the first, I think, that has uh, come up is um, what are the, for Jonathan, I think, what are the implications of the new evidence for UK autism services? Yeah, thanks, Tanya. And um, uh, just let me thank the wonderful speakers who've just uh, uh, spoken. Uh, in the last uh, few minutes. Um, yeah, so what's the implication? I've, answer, I've tried to answer some of the questions already in the chat, so people can, can look there. Um, I think what I'd say about the national strategy is that uh, we're in a window of opportunity, that um, uh, the National Autism Team, part of NHS England, um, are really um, interested in um, this care pathway that we've been talking about today and the approach that we've been talking about around uh, what we've called parent mediated intervention that you've heard about family focused. This is just in their minds and on the agenda. So it is a window of opportunity. They have funded um, a few pilots around the country. I alluded to that in my talk of putting this kind of care pathway into practice. Uh, I think the process of health system change is inevitably slow, but um, we need uh, what we call in the trade a theory of change. We need a plan, basically, and we need to just take um, step by step. And I think that started. And uh, I'm really encouraged that people in the NHS um, executive are, um, have really got, got this on board now and it has the attention of politicians. So I'm positive, basically, but it'll be slow but sure. And um, another question, um, should parent carers be looking for intervention around the point of identification? Well, uh, for me, I mean, I think, um, as I said in my, in my talk, um, that is one of the new things that we think now we have evidence to uh, in good faith um, promote. In other words, if you're going to put uh, this kind of really early 
uh, intervention support in before diagnosis, you've got to be sure in any area of healthcare, but in autistic development or neurodiversity for sure, that it's going to be appropriate. Uh, it's going to have good outcomes. It's not going to have adverse effects. Uh, and it's going to be uh, or, or on balance beneficial for families, um, whether or not their child goes on to be autistic. Um, and that's an important aspect that I didn't talk about. So in all those ways, when we've done these, what we call preemptive, pre-diagnostic interventions, we've looked at all that. And we think now we have the evidence to say, yep, it is worth doing that. And the uh, public health implications of that, about how health systems are organized, are pretty substantial. That's obvious. <laughs> and um, uh, it's not going to be totally easy to introduce that, um, but we think that's the appropriate thing. And what we're working at now, quite uh, hard actually, is to work out practical ways of doing this in the community that are going to work uh, equitably for people. So it's not a postcode lottery. And uh, yeah, we're working on that. So short answer, yes, I think it is appropriate. And we're working on how we can best do that with the evidence we've got. Um, I think uh, for Helen, what impact did introducing the new PACT intervention have on existing pressures in your service? Um, and how will this intervention become more accessible to families and carers, which I appreciate may be some. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one. I mean, I think the... Within the NHS, the demand um, is, we have to be honest, always going to outstrip our capacity in terms of the diagnostic bottleneck that, that Jonathan described. And that, uh, that is a focus um, inevitably currently. I'm hoping that we had a um, ascend inspection, which has got an action plan linked to it, which we're hoping will improve things as we, as we go forward in the next few years. I think it's given a, another tool and having an evidence-based tool is, is hugely advantageous. Um, and as I said, I'm really hoping that we shift the parents' focus as PACT becomes more um, recognised within um, the UK, even more than it is now, obviously with these sorts of events. I'm hoping that parents will be requesting PACT to go on EHCPs and PACT to be delivered um, without a waiting list, as opposed to other interventions with, with less robust um, evidence base. So that is my hope. But it, it really feels good to have something in our toolkit that we can now offer, even at the moment, if it's, if it's a small number of, of families that we're able to support. But hopefully, as we roll out um, and get this business case um, uh, delivered, um, we really hope and um, we feel very positive about the, the, the future. Thank you, Helen. Um, and then a question for Louisa. Um, how did you find giving a potted pack to the other adults in Frank's life? Is it something that I would assume would be good for e.g. grandparents to know about, but it also doesn't sound feasible to have these additional adults attending sessions? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, thanks. It's a great question. And, so well. <laughs> um, obviously, you know, PACT is highly individualised and it is all about that particular adult working with that particular child. So two things I'd say. One is um, it's, uh, it's amazing how much kind of rub off there is, if you like. So within our house, although I was the person doing the PACT sessions, my husband and my daughter just sort of over time just noticed that I was communicating in a slightly different way. So if I used more comments rather than asking lots of questions, they realized they, they witnessed that Frank would respond more. So they would then start to do it. Um, so, so that kind of thing definitely happens. And in kind of for wider family members that obviously aren't so um, available, and also I would possibly include school staff into that category as well. There are kind of sort of um, common strategies and principles that you can explain, particularly in the context of that particular child. So I can tell grandma and grandpa and, you know, the teaching assistants at school that, you know, just wait, just give Frank a bit more time to get his words out. You know, some, some autistic people are, are fine being asked questions, but Frank isn't. With Frank, it's highly sensitive. So notice what he's interested in and then just drop in a comment. And if he doesn't respond, don't worry about it. And if he does, then brilliant, you can build on that. So you can actually pass on some kind of uh, child specific strategies 
that that work because you're right you know for 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 all family members to start doing their own pack sessions could get a bit unwieldy <laughs> thank you louisa that's actually uh, great and also a question uh, for amanda which i just spotted and thought was going to be very interesting um and i've lost it so i'll come back to that in a minute so another point um i think probably from uh for catherine or, or amanda uh, what about older autistic young people how does that work for them yeah yeah I'll, I'll step in there maybe amanda would like to add to this um yeah the research trials we've only tested um of the results up to 11 years and that was because of the you know, criteria in the research. Um, however, I think you know, the principles about good quality communication are pretty universal. And um, all we're taking is that communication to a very high standard in which it's very um, adapted to the individual. And a lot of those principles are equally applicable to older children, young people, and I think, you know, particularly valuable for uh, people who are compromised in their communication, you know, where communication is difficult for them, they have difficulty um, feeling they're being heard or expressing their needs, wishes and wants. And to be in an, an environment, that supportive environment is very powerful. And, you know, as we've said already, the research is showing that um, person initiation is a key factor that that person feeling um, autonomous, empowered, and able to initiate more that their, whether it's nonverbal signals or verbal language, it doesn't matter, that their meaning is conveyed and received and responded to. So those are some of the very key principles that we know is sort of grounded in um, the research findings and could be taken forward, even though we haven't tested you know, the age range above 11 years. Amanda, do you want to add anything? Um, I guess it becomes sort of an ethos, really, about how you interact with people in general. You know, it doesn't, it, it is autism specific, but I don't think that, I think that's why there's no evidence of, of any kind of adverse effect, because it's just how we should really interact with everybody. Um, you know, in that attuned kind of way, in the way that we really try and understand the other person's perspective and what they're trying to communicate. Um, so I don't see why those principles couldn't be used with a child older than 11, but I guess um, it's just that the evidence isn't, isn't there yet. Perhaps I could uh, just comment um, to, to agree with that and to say that the thing about these treatments is that a lot goes into them in terms of working out the details of, of how you do this and how you train therapists, etc. And uh, the details of how one might apply these principles to adolescents and adults it really hasn't been worked out like that yet. And we know that that is would be a great thing to do. Um, you know, there are only 24 hours in the day, unfortunately. So. Um, but that is a task for the future, is to operationalize these kinds of principles into effective support for adolescents and adults. Uh, great job to do for someone. Great. Um, the other thing I noted on here, somebody asked about being used for 11 plus, but also without learning disability. Um, that I assume that can be used for anybody, yeah? Yeah, I think that's that's true. I did answer this in the chat, actually. But um, just to briefly say that you're, whoever made the, the comment is absolutely right that to have pick, picked up that in our initial PACT trial, uh, we purposefully, and this is going back to oh, 2004 or something, so it's a long time ago, um, that we purposefully looked at uh, children who had significant autistic development. Um, I mean, the, the terminology is difficult here, but at that time we were talking about, quotes, core autism. And um, why did we do that? Because we thought if we're trying to introduce a therapy of this kind, uh, let's make, you know, let's go for the, the kind of uh, kids that we actually do see in our clinics who have most effect and distress and difficulty in lots of ways. And um, 
so we, we, in a way, made life hard for ourselves by going for that group, to be honest. Um, but, um, and we showed effects in that group. Subsequently, and Catherine could comment, you know, we have done a lot of this work with um, autistic people with um, or children with um, ordinary cognitive ability. And uh, yeah, the same principles apply. And in the eye basis, this is the work that I presented for the babies. Um, there is no cognitive exclusion. So we've shown that we can do this across the cognitive range of the children. And we've had no evidence that cognitive ability makes a difference to how they respond actually. So that's an interesting one. So yeah, it's um, perfectly applicable, but that's the reason why in our first trial, we, um, we took that group. Okay. Um, there was just a question that came up about, um, I'm currently speaking with, uh, I found the therapist details on the PACT website. Is this the best way to go? I'm sure, assuming she has all the qualifications and training to deliver the intervention. I assume that is the case, if you want a PACT therapist. Yes, on, on the website, um, we have information um, which is under locations. So find a PACT therapist. And there you can look at all the professionals we've trained and there should be little markers of where they are on a map of the UK, but also internationally. Now we are asking professionals to register and give their consent. So they fill out a form and give their consent for their information to be shared on that website. So we're still building it, but we have got a large number of PACT therapists there on that find a PACT therapist. So that's, that's the first place to look but also do feel free to email us if you have any questions or have any personal you know, difficulties finding a, a therapist. I think because it's moving towards face-to-face um, -to -face and as uh, online as well as face-to-face -face, that we maybe are less constrained by location. It is more now accessible to all independently of your geographical location. So you know, we'll try and help you as best we can. And uh, we can, can try and connect people with NHS trusts um, or other other practices, you know, depending on your preferences. Great. So I'm conscious that we are trying to stick to time, and I know that Kathy is going to wrap this up, and we are actually bang on um, two fifty-five. So, so um, it's over to you, I think. <laughs> So just, just to summarise, um, also on the PAC, PAC website, you'll see information about training. So there are two levels of training. Level one is an e-learning. It takes about 90 minutes, and this is offered by Hographer Publishers. And, and this has some uh, video interactive tasks to demonstrate good communication technique um, for supporting autistic children. It also has um, videos of the different stages of PAC, just illustrating, has some information about those stages. Um, in addition, there's a video of a full PAC session, so it shows a therapist style. This is um, an introductory training, which is available for anybody who's interested in, in PAC and wants to know about the PAC principles. Um, but it's a requirement also to progress to level two if uh, the professional wants to become an accredited PACT practitioner. And the level two training, the registration is on our PACT training website. That's the website. And that's a two day live training. And there's post course supervised practice. And it comes complete with a manual and the PACT forms. So the next steps, well, first of all, I wanted to thank everybody. Um, a big thank you to all the presenters. I just thought they were absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, just really enjoyable and, and very thorough and very thought provoking, I think, uh, to triangulate it together between the science, the um, practice, practical application in NHS, uh, parents' values, and then young people and adults, autistic adults, you know, bringing them into this whole 
picture of what do we do to bring about the most valued outcomes. And I think to work together is, is, is the, gives the strongest basis for us, um, improving those outcomes and something that is worthwhile. Um, so our next steps are, um, please do go to the PACT website. This is, this is the website. On the webinar page, there will be, there's a link where all the resources will be available from this webinar. So there'll be a recording, full recording. There'll be a transcript for anybody who wishes to translate it. There'll be the PowerPoint. And we will post on there answers to the questions we haven't been able to address that you've, thank you for all your chat contributions. It's been very lively, very interesting. Um, and it's been, I've been, We've been trying to read through it as we go along, but we will have to go back to that and take our time to answer those questions. Um, just to say that the, it's global, PACT implementation is already in 21 countries, including Italy, France, Australia, Denmark, China, Hong Kong, Brazil, and beyond. So, you know, it is, um, we're having, aim to have the impact globally across different countries and cultures. We have um, a strong, associate membership. These are all our trainers and advisors who deliver PAC training internationally, who support and um, we give feedback to them and updates and support the extending the reach so that we can get achieve the maximum reach for the benefit of autistic people. Following on from your chat, uh, we'd really like to encourage you to continue the interaction. Um, I, I think this is just really valuable to have your input and interaction. Um, so please, we've, we've got some social media. We've got um, a Facebook pack, Pact International, which is open to the public. We've got Twitter at Pact Autism, there's an Instagram account. When you do um, continue that interaction, could you please use the hashtag which is the ACPW 2022 Autism Care Pathway webinar, so that um, we can all contribute to the, the discussion. Um, and finally, uh, we'd just like to say we do have ongoing training dates for level two training. Please look on the website. We've got a training course in June, September. There's international training, for example, Austro uh, America, in October, there's also dates for all the other countries that, that provide PAC training. So it's constantly updated as we get new dates. So please do keep looking on the, on the website where there'll be new information. And uh, just to say, thank you very much for supporting us. Thank you for joining this uh, webinar. We know um, some people who've registered um, are unable to make it, but we will post the recording so they can they can join us by looking at the recording and and, uh, and a big thank you to everybody all the presenters <laughs>